Hi everyone and welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Venetia and this is the Woolly Worker Knitting Podcast. So welcome everyone. This is episode 6 of the podcast. I'm super excited as always to be sitting down and recording today. I am coming to you from a cloudy but bright day in central Scotland near Edinburgh. It feels really, really nice to be filming at around 5 p.m. I remember when I started this podcast back in January, I had about a three to four hour long window where the light was um, appropriate for recording, which made things a little difficult and stressful, but we've got all day. And yeah, like I said, it's been, I think, three weeks since I sat down and recorded the last podcast, and God, I have a lot to talk about. So sit comfortably because this might be a long one but I'm not going to apologize too much about that because I know that you guys don't mind the longer type podcast I certainly don't so yeah grab some knitting I hope that you're working on something that brings you a lot of joy I'm working on a lot of pieces right now that are fulfilling that for me so it's been a really great month knitting wise and let me know what you're working on in the comments as always it's one of my favorite things to to do is to read the comments and reply to them I try and re reply to every single one and I think I'm doing uh, good for that and yeah it's just really great to like interact and have a bit of a back and forth today will also be a very special episode because there's a giveaway my second giveaway and it's to celebrate two things so first of all we reached 2500 subscribers which is amazing and insane i never thought it was going to happen like this fast or or ever and it it, it blows my mind that there's 2500 of you that like the videos I produce and like pour a lot of energy and love into so thank you so much for being a subscriber if you are one if you're not then subscribe that will be one of the requirements to win the giveaway but I'll give all the details of that at the end of the video and then the second thing to celebrate is that I went to my very first yarn festival it was the Scottish wool producer showcase in Perth Scotland just last weekend and I'll talk about that as well in the end of the video so stay tuned for that as always there's timestamps in the description of the video along with any and all information that I think is relevant to the projects I talk about I give in the description the name of patterns designers links color names like Ravelry it's very detailed and I know that you guys like you you've told me that I, it's a good description so there you go and uh, yeah the other thing to mention I guess is that you can find me on other social medias like Instagram and Ravelry at the Woolly Worker same as here on YouTube and here's a little hint there's also a giveaway happening on Instagram so if you want to up your chances of winning then just go check that post out there will be a couple of finished objects, a couple of works in progress, some acquisitions, the talk about the wool festival and then the giveaway. So that's kind of the structure of today. But first things first, I'll talk about what I'm wearing, which is also a finished object. So you may recognize this from the previous podcast or also the vlog that I did, which I posted last week. This was featured heavily. This is the single malt sweater by Maxim Sir, Max the Knitter. And this is actually the very first sweater that I've knitted for my boyfriend. So it's a male fitting piece. Um, I've made size three, but the gauge was different. So I'll talk about that as well. And as you can see, so it's got this like mock neck. It's quite high. I was worried it was a bit too high, but it's actually, it's actually fine. It's two by one rib and then it's a raglan. There's a really nice raglan detail on the shoulder and it's a really nice texture all over. And then uh, I added a modification actually, where on the side I added this raglan detail as well. And in the pattern, there were instructions on how to add the detail along here, the underarm. So I just decided to continue it down the body. And I'm really glad I did that. I asked my boyfriend if he wanted me to do that, and he said, Yeah. So, you know. It's good to be a knitter because then you can modify clothes as you wish and you can add and remove features like this. I really like the color on me. Usually I don't like brown that much, but this is looking nice. I'll of course include some photos of him wearing it and modeling it. It was so fun for once to be on the other side of the photo shooting that we do and for me to capture him wearing the knitwear. And I'll also put some photos or videos of me modeling it as well. So you can see what it looks like on a female body. Though of course, if you wanted to, you could uh, size up or down depending on what you prefer. Uh, the pattern is quite good. It gives measurements like schematics for the yoke length 
the circumference and then the armhole, uh, the arm circumference. So you can adjust like that bicep thing. Um, I made this with Cascade 220 and the colorway will be below. I think it was it's chocolate heather. And the yarn it was thinner than what was recommended. I think this is a worsted and he asked for an iron. So I sized down needles and I sized up the size of the pattern. So he, he recommends using five millimeter needles and I did this on 4.5 millimeter needles. And even though I should have done size two for my boyfriend, I did size three. And I'm really glad I did because if there's one thing to say about this pattern is that it is very fitting, which is something that to be fair, like was advertised in the pattern. I think maybe that was the wrong pattern to pick for my boyfriend's style because he prefers oversized clothes. And of course you could just make this a few sizes bigger, but I think it's good to stay true to the designer's and artist's vision when choosing a pattern. If the designer chose, made this pattern to be fitted, then maybe I should have made it, maybe you should make it fitted. And if you wanted an oversized sweater, choose a sweater that's made to be oversized. I think it's just easier and simpler that way, as opposed to like trying to modify it so much that it just changes everything. But that's just my personal opinion. Um, so yeah, on my boyfriend, it looks very tight and fitted, but he says that he likes it. And I will of course make him more sweaters in the future. This only took about three weeks. So, and I was working on other things at the same time. So not that long for a male sweater. The body was definitely longer than what I'm used to do. And same for the sleeves, these are quite long. Um, they still fit me. Like, I think it's quite nice to have long sleeves for once like that. They don't look overly long. But yeah, the sleeves and the body took a bit longer. It was all over texture, like I said, but that was not too much of a bother. There's a few knit rows in there, which make it look, uh, which make it go faster. And it's really easy to remember and it's repetitive. You get in the rhythm with it, kind of like a few other stitches like ribbing, which, you know, if you get in the rhythm of ribbing, that's fine. Shouldn't take too much longer compared to stockinettes and definitely faster than purling. So I really enjoyed making this sweater. I started it when I was doing my test net for the Primrose flipover, which I will talk about after. And it was like my passion project. I was having so much fun knitting on this. And then once that became my main whip, I sort of lost a bit of steam. Uh, there were a few things I was worried about. So that made me stop working on it because I just wasn't sure. And then I continued power through. I talk about it in my vlog, like I said, where I was knitting on the body and the sleeves of that. The things I was worried about were the raglan depth. Um, normally you, you increase for the raglan and then you split for sleeves, but I continued a few good inches or centimeters even before splitting for sleeves. And I talk about that in my Ravelry notes in more detail. I was also, like I said, worried that I made the neck rib too long, but we're still in two minds with my boyfriend if we're gonna fold down the neck like so, and just like, yeah, sew it down. But the worry here, like other people have mentioned is that it might show the t-shirt, which my boyfriend said he doesn't mind either if that happens, so that's fine. But just something to keep in mind um, with the neck, I guess. And because you start off at the cast on, the cast on is right here, it's not something that you can change your mind later. And I guess if you wanted to, you could start the cast on after the ribbing and then pick up and do the rib afterwards. But the short rows are in the rib and I wasn't feeling confident enough to try and do the short rows in pattern. So yeah, if you're more confident than me and you want to do your short rows and then you want to pick up the neck stitches later to do the rib, then be my guess, you can do that. The other thing I was worried about, and you can see here, um, I was worried that the fabric wasn't dense enough and it's even more pro prominent on my boyfriend. Um, his arms are bigger, I guess. So I was worried that you'd be able to see like skin showing through the gaps, but after blocking that sort of disappeared a little bit because the yarn bloomed and softened and just filled in those gaps. But something to keep in mind with things such as ribbing, textures like ribbing, because of the way that the knits and pearls interact, they will, there might be some, some more gaps than you would in stockinettes. I think it's fine. If you're wearing a long sleeve, dark top, then you can't see skin showing. Um, and softness wise, I think it's really good. It's definitely like a wool. It's 100% wool cascade. It's non superwash. 
but it's not itchy. I wouldn't say it's itchy at all. I wouldn't say it's soft either. I really think this is a true sort of neutral fabric. And yeah, the texture is just really addictive to knit up and really addictive to touch. It's so funny. It's very bumpy. The wrong side of it looks quite good as well. But yeah, I'd highly recommend the pattern. Something else to mention was for the cast on, at first I was trying to maybe find a cast on that was like tubular, but I couldn't find anything. So I just did my normal German twisted cast on and I think it's fine. It just gives like a nice straight edge. And then for the bind off, I did something called like the Rook bind off. And I put a link in my um, Ravelry page. And it's a bind off that basically have has you um, thread your needle pearl wise through the first three stitches and then you slip one off and then you thread it through again pearl wise through three stitches and then you slip one off and you do that over and over and it makes it really elastic which is good again i was worried at the start before blocking because it all cinched in and pulled in at the bottom of the body but once i blocked it it looked more rectangular and like right angles which is what uh, i wanted so blocking really helped with all of that. Blocking also made the sweater grow, which was good because as I said, it was quite tight and very snug at the beginning. But after blocking, it grew widthwise and lengthwise. So the sleeves got a bit longer, which is good. The body got a bit wider at the chest. So we gained a good few, I think it was five centimeters that we gained, which is good and it gave more, more room. Uh, like I said, I was worried about the raglan length, but in the end, those worries were unfounded. And it's, it may have looked weird at the start when you continued knitting even without increasing, but that part really just gets hidden in the underarm when you're wearing it. So yeah, that's fine. And yeah, I'm looking at this sweater on me and I definitely think I'm going to be stealing it from my boyfriend and that it's not going to be his sweater for very long but i'll definitely be making more sweaters for him it was it was a really great experience to be knitting for someone else and yeah i recommend the pattern i recommend the yarn this was a great project i'm really happy to have done this goal it was on my list to make a sweater for my boyfriend and to make the single malt this has featured on my channel like for a while so i'm glad that this is the end of that chapter and yeah, let's move on to the next bit. Oh, actually, before we do that, I'll just put here the price of this project. This project was very affordable. As you can see, it only costs £35, around £35 to do. Uh, I bought five kinds of yarn and I used half of the last one. So, and I got the yarn on sale. So for a 100% wool sweater, it took three weeks. It was affordable. It probably will be quite sturdy. I don't see this pilling. Well, I'll obviously feedback on that later, but I, I really think that this is going to be a really long lasting sweater, very comfy, very warm. I can see that being quite warm and I totally do this again. There's lots of different colors that this would look great in. We kind of took the color that the model was wearing uh, in, for, for Maxim. It's called a single malt after all, but I can see this in like a very dark navy blue or like some khaki greens. Even some people have done it in a light gray, which looks great. So yeah, let me know if you're gonna make this sweater. It's a very, very popular sweater for people who want to knit for men in their lives or male knitters. And I, I can see why, I'd really recommend the pattern. But read other people's notes and on Ravelry and be prepared to lengthen the yoke if that's what you need. You can use the schematics anyway to see if you've reached the yoke depth that you were needing to do. And also just be careful if you're trying to substitute yarn like I did. Hi, sorry, I forgot to mention when I was recording that there was one big modification that I made to the single malt sweater pattern and that was regarding the sleeves. So the original pattern has you do sleeve decreases a certain amount of time. A lot of people have mentioned in the Ravelry pages, so I, I guess it's okay if I say it. So you have to decrease every four rounds and a lot of people have complained that that is way too fast uh, and the sleeves become too tight. So what I've done is I've decreased every eight rounds instead. And I also skipped the last round of decreases, which meant that in the end, my stitch count, I had two stitches more than what I was supposed to end up with. But I just continued on with that. So that was the difference I made. And the way that I kind of figured that out was because I measured my gauge swatch and I used that to calculate what the diameter of the sleeve would be at the top and what the diameter would be at the bottom if I did it the way that it was supposed to be and I realized that that was going to be too tight so I decided to 
to slow down the increases, which worked really well. And apart from that, like I said, it's a great pattern with a great fit. But if you have bigger arms or if you like to have more ease on the arms, then I'd recommend doing that modification and it turned out just great. But all of the modifications, again, are in the Ravelry notes. Just wanted to quickly mention that because it is a significant change to the pattern. Okay, so the next item is a finished object and it's the primrose slipover that I was almost done doing in the last episode and the pattern is out now. It was a test knit that I did for Along, Along Avec Anna and I made it in her yarn, Along Avec Anna, in the soft silk mohair and the merino. So here it is in all its glory. That's perfect, it fits in the frame. So it's a beautiful, beautiful color. It's kind of hard to capture, but I'll put a lot of photos and videos as I'm speaking so you can see kind of the differences in it. Um, it's a slipover that basically is like a front and a back panel that are just joined with double knitted ties at the end. You could make the back a bit longer like I did. It's subtle, but I tried to make the back a bit longer and you can make it as long or as big as you want. Some people have made it a bit more cropped, some people haven't. The double knit tie instructions have changed a little bit to make the ties thinner and longer, but I would say that when you're blocking this, you have a lot of leeway to really just do what you want with those ties. I, I made mine longer to save up on yarn. Uh, this is the neck. It's quite a big, thick, long, tall neck, but there's apparently also instructions in the final pattern on how to make the neck like smaller. The thing that's different with mine as well, but you really can't tell, is that I ran out of mohair at the very end, so my ribbing oh, is made without. But like I say, it, you really can't tell. Anna did a wonderful job with her yarn at making it very like a, a, a perfect match between the mohair and the merino. So it just looks like one uniform piece of fabric. It's really nice and drapey. I had to go down one needle size to meet gauge. I think hers is initially made on four millimeter, but I went down to 3.75. And yeah, it's a very simple construction. You start at the back and then you pick up the left and the right shoulders, you make some short rows and you just knit down and then you add the ties at the end and the neck at the end. I will say, as great as the pattern was and as great as the test knitting experience was, it wasn't my favorite knit to do in terms of interest because it is basically just two rectangular pieces of fabric knitted flat, which I know a lot of people will love because it's mindless and repetitive and you really don't need instructions for very long. But for me, I was really craving some more action and craving a bit more breaking up the pace with more things happening. And then once you're done with that, it's double knitted uh, bands that you've got to do for quite a while. So it wasn't the most interesting or fun knit, but it was really rewarding. And at the end, I absolutely love the final result. It's a very unique piece. And I really, I don't think I've seen anything like that in, in stores either. So I'll obviously be putting uh, photos of me modeling it. I think it looks amazing over this floral shirt I was wearing, but some people have been modeling it with dresses. I don't know if I'll make a second one because like I said, it was really tedious for me towards the end. And I guess also because I had the test net deadline and the fact I had to make it to the gauge that the designer needed. So there were quite a lot of deadlines and pressures that were fine, but just made it a bit less enjoyable. And it made me realize that I liked test knitting and I'm so glad I was chosen. I, you know, told Anna I'd be happy to do it for her again. I think in the future, I'm gonna be much more mindful about the test knits I'm applying to, which I've been doing that this um, uh, spring season. I've been really mindful not to apply to every test knit because, you know, there's always the risk of getting picked. So I need to really think, do I want to knit this piece or do I just want to be a test knitter? So I think I'll be test knitting less this year. I'm happy I did it. And yeah, I highly recommend the yarn. It's really soft. Of course, it's mohair, so you might not like that or like the way it feels. As far as mohairs go, I would say that this is similar to knitting for olive or maybe um, tin silk mohair. I would say it's not as soft as Isagur mohair or uh, Tilia, which are the ones that I personally prefer, but that depends for everyone. So. If I were to make one again, I probably would just make it in her double merino to have a mohair free version. And I'd be more careful about the way that I pick up the next stitches because I'm not super happy with the way I did it on this one. And then lastly, I would say if you're gonna get the pattern, if you need tips on how to pick up for the 
bands on the side, maybe read my notes. Uh, someone explained to me, another tester explained how to pick up the stitches because you've got this I chord edge on the side and it's, you know, an I chord is made with slip stitches. And when you have a slip stitch edge, that spans over the course of two rounds. So if you have to pick up two stitches over those two rounds, you only have one slipped edge to go into. And it's impossible to pick up two stitches from one stitch because the yarn will just like undo itself. I hope you know what, what I mean. Um, so there's a trick for that is for the I chord edge, then you pick up one stitch from the slipped edge that's closest to you and one stitch from the I chord edge that's like rolled in. So yeah, I don't know. Anna said that she might do a video later to show you how she picked up her stitches. And also to bind off my double knitted ties, I use the Italian bind off because double knitting basically has uh, knits and pearls. So that's an appropriate bind off to use if you want something stretchy and invisible. And I think it does the job. Oh, the price of the Primrose slipover will be put here below. So obviously it's a little bit more pricey because there's that second strand of mohair, but compared to other sweaters, it's not that pricey. And it was a good opportunity to sample Anna's yarn. We got a little discount code. We got 10% off our order, which was very generous of Anna. And yeah, having sampled her yarn and having seen her wonderful color selection, I already have 10 projects in my queue using her 10 colors. Like they're all on point. So I've talked about this project already, so I won't go on too, too long about that. The other work in progress I had was the uh, X for Easter socks, but I did nothing on that. That's, um, I haven't even cast it on the second sock, which is a shame because I know the longer I leave it, the worse it'll be, but I just have been so excited about all the other cast-ons. So no second sock yet, but I will do it at some point because I, I really want to wear the, 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 the pair. I think they're adorable and it's nice as my first color work socks. The other work in progress that has featured on the channel, I think last episode, this was literally one round had been done, but this has featured heavily on my vlog that I posted last week. And this is the Burra Cowl by Mary Wallen. It's a color work Shetland Fair Isle cowl made in Jimison Shetland Spinrift. And this is what we've got. So as you can see, I've got two re repeats done. So there's like two of the green thing and two of the pink thing. Two repeats are done and I just need to do, I think one more. The pattern calls for four more, but I think if I do three, that'll cover me. I think, I think four would be overkill, definitely. So I think, so I'm two thirds of the way done. Something else I'm noticing here is that I definitely got tighter over time. This is looser and, and long, bigger. But I think I might be able to block this out and it'll be joined in the round. Um, I made a provisional cast on and I'll be kitchenering that at the end. There's a neat little trick because the pattern has you start on a sort of color work area. But there are some rounds of just plain stockinette knitting. So at some point there are two rounds of stockinette. So I've provisionally cast it on on this plain stockinette and I'll be kitchenering doing that plain stockinette. So it'll be perfectly seamless. Mary Wallen has you just cast on normally and then seam it, but a lot of people on Ravelry have recommended doing the provisional cast on and then choosing that right ra ra row to start on that lets you do this seamless thing. So I was doing really good on that. I was basically able to do one repeat over a weekend. And then I did that again the next week. I did one repeat over the weekend. But then last weekend I was too busy, so I didn't work on it at all. So I know that this probably could be done in like two or three more days, which is so exciting. This is very addictive because all the sections are so small, like the sections that have you used two colors. I think at most it's like four and then you're already switching. So I just keep on wanting, I, keep, I just keep on wanting to reach the next color. And before I know it, a repetition is over. It's also quite easy to memorize. There's only uh, that re that repeat with the stars here. I need to look at the charts a lot, but all the rest, the stitch repeats are so small. They're like, you know, over like four or five. Something I wanted to mention about this is color dominance. So if you don't know when you're doing color work, it matters which ball of yarn is on the left or the right, or which ball of yarn you're carrying under and over each other. So I knit mine with 
my right hand, both colors, I sort of drop them and pick them back up, English style, is kind of what I do. And so when I'm doing this, I'm keeping my, the color I want dominant to stand out, I'm keeping that on the left. And then the background color I'm holding on the right. And that worked for me. What's important is that you, you're consistent with what you do. Like if you're putting your knitting down halfway through a round and picking it back up, you really have to make sure that you're doing it the same way that you were doing. Otherwise it will be visible. But something that's not always obvious is what is the background color and what is the foreground, especially when you're looking at the pattern chart because it's black and white and it all kind of blends together with the symbols being used to determine like the colors. So what really helped me was looking at other people's projects on Ravelry because seeing it like this, it is like more obvious, for example, that, you know, here the purple triangles are supposed to be dominant and the pink is supposed to be a background. Usually what you would have is like, if there's two colors like that, the big bold color is going to be the dominant and the light is going to be the background, but that doesn't always apply. So just be mindful. So yeah, looking at other people's projects helped me know which one was supposed to be dominant. And it didn't take too, too much time to figure out, but I was happy to have done that little bit more effort to figure it out so that it would end up with a more polished, finished result. Um, what I did actually, if you noticed, is that um, because it was annoying me to have the ends roll up, is I just very provisionally like just took one piece of string, the beige one here, and just like did a back stitch or a whip stitch. I whip stitched the edges together just as a temporary measure to even be able to visualize more what this would look like as a rectangle as opposed to having like the tube that kept on rolling out. But obviously I'll be undoing that at the end. And what I wanted to show you was my floats or like my, my ends. What I do is like every, um, like, yeah, kind of every 10, 15 rounds, I tie them up just to keep them out of the way. But obviously I'll be dealing with the ends later on. Um, we, we don't talk about that yet. <laughs> I think I'll do the ends and then I'll block it and then I'll seam it is how I'm gonna get go about doing that. But yeah, I really wanna get this done because I want to free up my needles. I need to use my needles for sweaters. So yeah, two days, three days of work and this could be done. And just in time for Scottish spring and summer. And also I'm worried it's gonna be quite thick. There's four repetitions of that and I was half considering only doing three, but I would be worried it would be like really small. But now that I think about it, this could have been fine as a length, wouldn't it? Yeah. But I could always fold it like once it's a cowl and wear it like that. Yeah, I think this is gonna be really great. I think it looks so professional and like something that, yeah, I wanna hang on my wall. The colors are amazing. I'm using all the colors that are suggested except two. I'm using pine instead of moss and I'm using yellow ochre instead of burnt ochre. And that was literally because of like what I had on hand. I ordered most of the colors at my local yarn shop, Be Inspired Fibers, except two that I already had in stash. And if you've tried ordering Fair Isle colors from an online shop, it's a nightmare because they usually don't have the ones you need. Like I needed 11 or 12 colors. It would be really difficult for them to be stocking all of those. But thankfully I found a shop that mostly did. So it all worked out. It really made me want to do more Fair Isle projects. It's not that big a deal. It's not hard. It's not that daunting. Like I said, it's very easy to just see it as little sections and then they get done much faster than you think. So I would, I will 100% do a sweater, Fair Isle sweater one time. What I'll do next is a vest. I'm going to do the Brunsfield vest by Isolde Teague, which is made bottom up and there's sticking involved. I've ordered a yarn for that yesterday, uh, but it hasn't arrived. So I'll show that next time. And I don't know if I'll be starting that anytime soon. I just wanted to have the yarn already for it. All right, so the next project has also featured on the channel, in the vlog, but not on the last podcast because it didn't exist yet. I have started and almost finished the April Cardigan by Petite Knit. So this was made using Drops Flora in beige and Philcola Natilia in chai, which I had bought earlier this year and showed in an episode. I was really happy with that like match of the colors. 
This is what the yarn looks like. So this is Flora and this is Chai. Flora is more cool, Chai is more warm. Chai is like this beautiful golden color. Um, so yeah, this is what the yarn looks like. And are you ready? Here's the sweater. <laughs> it was actually really weird deciding to film today because if I just wait until tomorrow, I could show you the finished sweater. Um, so yeah, here is the cardigan in its entirety. So I'm just doing the button band here and then it's, it's done. So I've got nice sleeves. The thing about the April cardigan is definitely the shoulder construction. It's like a saddle shoulder. So you can see here is the saddle. Ooh. Yeah. And then it's a raglan. Uh, and then it's a cropped cardigan. It's quite small. Um, so I've picked up stitches all around and I'm just doing the ribbed button band. I know a lot of people have modded this cardigan to use the double knit button band of the champagne cardigan, but I found that so tedious and hard and I really wanted to try a ribbed edge. So here's what I've done so far. I've done like a few rounds. Uh, so I'm halfway through the button band. I've just made the button holes. Yeah, so I'll probably, what I'll do is I'll talk about that in much more detail in the next podcast when I can like showcase it and demonstrate it. This was kind of an impulse knit. I wanted to knit one more thing using mohair because we're getting into warmer weather. And today actually I was just saying like my hands were quite sweaty while working on it because of all the mohair. So I'm glad to be getting that stash like worked on. I'm really happy that I'm using the Flora because I bought that last year quite early on. And I'm happy to be doing a petite knit pattern because like, this is the reason why I love them. They're just so straightforward. You know what to expect, you know what you're getting. And I, I'm just so used to that way of being written and instructions that like, it takes away a lot of guesswork. So it's just a very safe, comfortable pattern to go to. There was a couple of things with this pattern. I'll just mention very briefly, because if you're like me and like, if it tripped you up, then here's maybe advice. So firstly, when you're doing the construction, the yoke, the very, very first round, at some point it has you do two increases next to each other, like a make one left and a make one right. And at first it tripped me up thinking that this was going to leave a big hole. But when you're picking up for the button band, it's fine. The hole disappears. So here's me telling you, like, don't worry. Do the two increases next to each other and it doesn't matter. And then the second thing is that when you're making the double band, the, the, the button band, uh, it says to like knit five and then bind off like three or four for the button band. But if you're knitting five and then you're starting to bind off, you're going to lose one of those five stitches as part of the bind off. So what I did was that I knitted five, knitted one more, and then bind off. And then that way I was left with those five stitches intact at the bottom, which might seem obvious for some people, but for me, it, I was just, I wasn't sure if that was the right thing to do, but that's what I did. So I'm just even leaving it here for um, posterity. I'm doing the buttonholes just a tad smaller than what she recommends, but apart from that, uh, I didn't do any other modifications. I absolutely love the fit of the sleeves. I tried it on in my latest vlog, and I'm just gushing over how like perfectly like slim they are. They're quite tapered, there's a lot of decreases. With Petite Knit as well, I'm always on gauge using the needles that she recommends, so that's also very easy. I didn't even do a gauge swatch for this one. I was also worried I was gonna run out of mohair. I only had four balls, but that was more than enough. I just have enough to like finish the button band and then some. So maybe I could have made it like a tad longer, but I just made it to the length specified by the pattern. I made it in size small. And yeah, I'm already thinking of the next one because I really, really, really like the construction. The yoke was made in two days. I was just obsessed with it because there's basically three different parts. So it was extremely addictive because you just kept on wanting to reach the next part. And by the time I was done with the yoke, I just decided to do the sleeves to get them over with. And so I did that last week during the vlog. And then I just had the body to do. And because it's cropped, there wasn't that much to do. And then the ribbing at the bottom is quite hefty. So again, there's not that much purling for cardigans to do because you're already doing ribbing really soon. So I 
found this cardigan to be knit knitting up so so fast it was very enjoyable i love the fit so far i can't wait to see what it looks like with the button band and when i'm thinking of future yarn combinations i'm 100 percent thinking of either brushed alpaca for like a black one or just a dk weight yarn or also like a strand of uh, alpaca like lace alpaca because I would like a mohair free version of this, even though I love this mohair. I like the subtle glow that it gives with that like golden uh, chai color. But I really want to get one that I could wear maybe, yeah, in summer over dresses. That would be amazing and like a very like bright fun color. Like maybe one that goes with my floral dresses, like pink or red. I don't think I'll ever make a pink cardigan, but maybe a red cardigan. That could be a bold statement. Maybe I could make it in cotton merino, or maybe just merino. But yeah, it's a great pattern, highly recommend it. And it feels really fitting to be finishing my April cardigan on basically the 30, 31st of March. So yeah. The next thing to talk about, I had talked about the yarn in the last episode, and it's the Kinross 4-ply yarn. This is one of my favorite yarns to work with ever. It's from We County Yarn. I was influenced by Rebecca from the Crea Bea. This might be why the name sounds familiar, Kinross for Ply, because she was the one to talk about it a lot. And I have felt what it feels like when it's blocked, and it is true, like the hype is true. It does feel like cashmere, it's incredibly soft. And I just also have a list of like 20 sweaters to do in all 20 colors of this. This is the color Scott's Pine. It's a nice dark blue. If you look, I don't know if this is going to be able to show. There's like flecks of very light electric blue in the yarn. And I'm going to make the Bibliophile Sweater by Alicia Plummer, like I mentioned. And I've already started. So let me show you what I've got so far. It's on small needles, but this is a um, top-down raglan quite basic. It's a compound raglan, so it's meant to be like really nice fitting. Um, yeah, this is very shapeless, I'm sorry. I might put a photo later on of like what it looks like when it's all spread out. <laughs> but yeah, so I think the thing that I've been enjoying the most with that is actually the fact that it's fingering weight. I'm working this on 3.5 millimeter needles and I just, it's quite see-through, isn't it? But there's, yeah, there's quite a lot of fabric. I've been really enjoying working on this. I feel like that needle size is very comfortable for my fingers and my hands. Um, I just find it very satisfying. And the yarn, when it's not washed, is quite, it's not rough at all. I wouldn't say it's rough or itchy or scratchy. It just feels very um, inelastic and dry. And it just feels so weird. Like I feel like I have this insider knowledge secret that I know it's going to soften up so much once it's blocked. The gauge is quite fine, but it's not too dense either. Like the fabric, as you can see, like is a bit holy, but it blooms when it's washed. And I can't remember, I think, yeah, I went down the needle size. I'm using 3.5 and Alicia is using four millimeters. And also her row gauge is insane. I think hers is like... 28 rows and I'm at 34 rows and a lot of other people on Ravelry are as well So the thing that I'm gonna have to do with this pattern is when I'm done with the yoke and actually I am I am done with the yoke in creases So normally I would split her sleeves, but I tried it on and I'm not ready to do that. So I'm gonna knit I think 12 rounds even and then split her sleeves There's a really good schematic in the pattern where you can really see like if you're on track with measurements for every part of the pattern, every part of the garment. Um, the other thing that I was going to do, because I'm very much in between two sizes, I'm in between her size two and three, and the size two was just going to give me like three centimeters of ease, and the size three was going to give me like 10 or 13 or something, which was too much, because I wanted this to be a bit more fitting. So what I did was that I'm going to, I did size two, but I'm adding two raglan increases, so eight body stitches overall. And this is gonna give me three more centimeters according to my gauge. And I'm only doing one increase for the sleeve. So this is gonna give me the sleeves of size three, but they're not gonna be too big either. 
So it's nice to be able to do those little modifications without worrying too much. It was either that or do size three, but then size down. But I thought I'd do the opposite, size two, and then make it longer and bigger. The thing that was weird as well with this pattern, like this is why I do petite knits, right? Because I knitted the first round of this and Alicia has you place one raglan, one stitch marker per raglan. And normally petite knit has you place a stitch marker like before and after the raglan stitch. But Alicia doesn't. So it's like knit up to one stitch before the marker. Then you make your increase. Then you knit one. Then you slip the marker. And I couldn't figure out with the way that the increases were done. Because it's a compound raglan, there's also some increases on the wrong side. It was just getting so confusing. I didn't know... What the, raglan was, what the raglan was supposed to be like, but then it dawned on me that the raglan is a two-stitch raglan, so that all fixed itself on the second and third round, like I could see what was happening, and then the stitch marker is between the two raglan stitches, so that's fine, that makes sense. Something that I was considering doing was like adding my stitch markers like to make the raglan stitches between those markers, but I was worried to do that because then when the pattern says knit to the marker, I wouldn't remember if it was my marker or like the one that Alicia had me place. So I decided to just follow the pattern religiously to the T, even if that meant I had to be looking at the pattern the entire time, that's fine. And then in the end I didn't need to look at the pattern because after the compound section is done, it's just a normal raglan where you're like increasing every other row and then that's just very fun and easy. So yeah. And then for the neck option, there's quite a few different ones, but I think I'm going to do the turtleneck version because that yarn is so soft, I want it next to my neck. I have a big train ride tomorrow, so I think I'm going to bring this project and do the neck while I'm on the train ride, like the collar, because I'm still trying to figure out how long to make the yoke and I'm not going to be trying this on on the train. So yeah, this fingering weight sweater will be keeping me company on the train journey tomorrow. And this one has become my new favorite project, like it's my baby that I feel like I'm cheating on everyone else with when I'm working on that one. And I feel like I had that last time with the fingering weight sweater where I was going into that thinking it was going to be like a very long term project. But then because I love it so much and I'm working on, working on it much more, it I don't see this taking too long because once I'm done and it's split for sleeves, it's just sleeves and body and like that's it. She, Alicia has recently published like Bibliophile 2 and 3, I think it's like in a DK or a sport. And then she also published one for men, which fits differently. So if you like the look of this pattern, then you're welcome to go check those out. There's one thing that people have said though about this pattern is that the raglan might be a bit weird, where there's like a bunch of extra fabric, and I have noticed that on some people's photos. And I'm not quite sure how to fix that. Either have less body stitches or make the raglan less deep. I don't know. But it's something that people like have noticed and then mentioned. And if they hadn't noticed that, I wouldn't have noticed that. But I'm trying to train my eye and my knowledge to be able to better recognize when something is fitting or isn't. I feel like the more I'm knitting, the more I'm learning those kind of technical skills about like it's not knitting as a skill. It's not just about following instructions and making a stitch. I feel like the act of making a stitch is like one of the simplest thing to do, like the knit stitch. And what's actually difficult in, in knitting is to make the garments fit you. Like if you if you've ever been a beginner knitter and everyone has, you know, we've all made huge mistakes. We've all made stuff that didn't go over our head or things that ended up being five sizes too large or running out of yarn halfway through because we didn't understand yardage or whatever. And all of that are things to get better at and perfect our skills, which is why I'm, I'm trying to do this year. Okay, so next I wanted to do one more sweater because it's going to be cherry blossom season if it isn't already. And it would be the perfect photo op opportunity to go and do a little photo shoot in the cherry blossoms in Edinburgh. Uh, and I was trying to think of what sweater I could do to, to do to get that. And I was thinking of making the Cargill sweater by Rebecca. I have the pattern, I have the yarn. And if you saw my vlog last week, then you saw that I wound it up into a cake and everything. And I already have my swatch. 
But then I changed my mind because I thought the pattern is known to be a little tricky, especially the beginning of it. And I just wasn't in the mood to be frustrated or having to think too much. And it's also a demanding pattern in terms of like, it eats a lot of yarn, it takes a while, it's all over texture and the dip stitch is harder and, you know, requires more technical abilities than this all over texture, even though it is as mindless because you kind of um, get used to it. But I didn't want to put myself on a deadline like that for a sweater of like that heft. So I changed my mind and I thought I would make a very like big gauge chunky sweater because I would be sure to be done in time. However, it's not going to be in those nice romantic soft colors like the Cargill was going to be. I decided to go for black. So I showed this yarn before when I bought it recently. This is Filcolana Peruvian Highland Wool in charcoal and this is Filcolana Alva in black. And I'm so excited to be trying this yarn combination together because I'm a huge fan of non-mohair and mohair alternatives. I'm totally on the hunt for what works and what doesn't, gauge-wise gauge or like texture-wise or warmth-wise. Like I'm just very curious to know like if it does work, what are you sacrificing? But anyway, so this is a lace alpaca that you can use instead of mohair. And Filcolana has a really good selection of colors for that. This is just black, but they've got like dozens of colors, which could be really good. And then Filcolana Peruvian Helen Wool is like a really great 100% wool. Um, I want to say worsted or DK. I'm not quite sure. It's 100 meters per 50 grams. And yeah, I think I showed my swatch in the last podcast, in the last vlog. But I'll show you what I've done so far. So I've just made the back panel of the sweater and I've made one shoulder. This is the Dartmoor sweater by Kadri. So here's the back and here's one shoulder. Um, it's looking quite small at the moment, but that's fine because I still need to add the sleeves. The gauge was different. She asked for 15 stitches gauge and I'm at 16 slash 17. So I'm following the instructions for size medium, but I'm aiming to get a size extra small or small because it has 20 to 25 centimeters of ease. Um, I won't show this too much because there's not that much to say. What I really do like is how the colors are looking together because I was worried at first they were going to be too different, that dark gray and that black, but in the end, it's more... It's marling a little bit, but I think it works. I was aiming for this to be like my black sweater, but now I realize this is not, it's gonna be my dark gray sweater, it's fine. I'll definitely still make a big black sweater at some point. I'm thinking maybe like the Semper sweater by the Knit Pearl Girl in just like a DK black, not even mohair or anything, just like one strand of black, something that is really soft and comfortable, or also Kinross 4 ply in black, fingering weight black sweater would be absolutely amazing. I'm trying out a few fingering weight sweaters. Uh, one on my list is the Cozy Classic Light by Jessie Made Design, but I've heard things about it being like too wide at the neck, so I want to see first if I like that or how I could modify it before I cast it on in the black. But yeah, the Dartmoor sweater is going well. I'm just gonna try and finish it on time. The pattern is really, really like well written. There's a nice video instruction that shows you the um, hard part, um, which is really good when a designer does that. Like the flagship aspect of the um, pattern is like the I-cord edge at the back. So it shows you how to do that, which is helpful. I like the fabric that this gives together. The Alva definitely brings softness to the Peruvian Highland wool. It just makes it very like buttery and creamy. I know those are not words that you should use with knitting because what does it mean? But it's just, it, it makes it more plush and lush. Like it's not soft in the like fuzzy mohair sense. It's more like, just makes it more bouncy and squishy. So yeah, really happy with that. I also, yeah, went down the needle size then for the gauge because I didn't like the fabric I would get with the 5.5 millimeter. So I'm making it on five. 
And I think that's it for the Dartmoor. I hope I wasn't too fast talking about all those projects, but there were a lot of them and I didn't want to like be speaking about them for hours. I think next time I see you, I'll be wearing my April cardigan and maybe have finished my burra cowl, if that's not too much to ask. But yeah, I can't wait to keep working on the fingering weight sweater because I want to buy more Kinross for ply in different colors. I want to do more fingering weight sweaters. At first I thought I was going to maybe make one or two a year, but now I'm like, I'm, I'm going to make one a month. No, I'm kidding. I can't do that. Uh, okay, so that was all the works in progress. The next thing is acquisitions. So I bought some yarn on sale at knit.co.uk. They were trying to get rid of some scentless yarn, which is one of like, I really like that brand. So I bought a lot of that, but that didn't come yet. So can't show you, but I got yarn to make a petite knit sweater and I got yarn to make a My Favorite Things knitwear sweater. So that's very exciting, but it's quite like one of them is Pierrigant and one is Double Sunday. So I think that those are going to be for autumn, maybe. And I also got yarn for my Monday sweater to pair with my brushed alpaca. If you've been following me, it, like this has been featured in almost every episode. So unfortunately, I can't show you a swatch yet because I don't have the yarn. But next episode, I'll definitely have swatched with the Surrey. The yarn I got is Lanagato VIP in the color of white or Ecru. And it's just like a white. I know lots of people were saying to do it in the green, but I thought the white was going to be more subtle and more wearable for me. And I'm just going all in, like the Lanagato VIP has some cashmere content in it. I just think it's going to be amazing. So looking forward to that. So the purchases that I actually can show you, I got at my very first wool festival. It was the Scottish Wool Producer Showcase organized by the lovely Eva and um, it was amazing. There's another event in September, which is more about indie dyers from Scotland, but I think also England. But this one was way much more about British wool and British wool producers. Some people were also selling fibers for spinning. But I can't speak about that because I don't know anything about it. I was so happy to be going there with my uh, friends. So I went there uh, with Ode from Bubbles and Berries podcast. She lives in Edinburgh. And I also went there with Sam from The Shugly Stitch. She lives just outside of Edinburgh like me. And um, it was... I felt so privileged to be able to go to a wool event with my knitted with my knitty friends. It's not something I ever thought was going to be possible six months ago before I started the channel. I was just, like I said, knitting alone in my room, talking my boyfriend's ears off about all things knitting. And now I'm going to a wool festival with my friends. It's just amazing. I had the absolute best day. We arrived there at 11 and we left at like three or four. So it was a whole day thing. There were a lot of stalls and I remember being a bit overwhelmed at first, thinking like I went to a few stalls, my head was spinning, you know, just like so much yarn, so much like choice. And then Sam was making fun of me. She was saying, you know, you haven't even seen like the event in September. It's like three times the size of that. So I'm glad I went to that one as my first one and I'm working my way up to, you know, being able to go to like a bigger festival. It was a very lovely event, really well organized, lovely vendors. I was able to, you know, chat with them and talk things like wool. We did a whole kind of round at first where we just looked at all the yarn and touched it, squished it. Then we stopped and like sat down, talked about things. It was good to like bounce ideas off of each other about like, what do you think? What project are you wanting? What yarn got your attention? It was so funny because there was one stall that I must have gotten back to like four times. I could not stop thinking about it. So I'm really glad I got something from there because it was a sign, right? Like if you can't stop thinking about yarn over the course of the whole day, it means that you really want it. So I'll show you what I got. I got three like sweater quantities and one single skein. So this is a single skein. This is from Nervous Fiber. I've spoken about her before, Charlotte. She's a Scottish Glasgow based dyer. And this is actually a base from John Arben. This is the Devonia base, which is a mix of a few fibers. And it's fingering weight 
And this is then uh, like the basis from John Arban, but then Nervous Fiber dyes it. It's on her website right now, actually. This base, it's called Buttered. And it's just very, very pretty. It's, I don't know, it, it's not quite yellow, is it? Like it's more like golden. It really is, a, this is a really good representation of what it looks like in real life. I was originally thinking of doing socks with that, but now I'm rethinking everything because I'm not sure this would be good for socks. It doesn't have any ni nylon, for example. I'm thinking maybe a muscle bra hat, but I don't know if I would suit a yellow mustard hat. Although actually, no, actually that would totally be cool. That would be amazing with a yellow hat. Okay, this is a strong contender for a muscle bra hat. And I definitely have enough yarn. So yay, cool, that's sorted. Then the next thing I got was this, those kinds of yarn. Uh, and as you can see, this is the drapiest thing, right? So what is it made of, I hear you ask? It's made of 70% alpaca, 30% rose, so rose fiber. And I've looked up online about this and I really can't find much. It's quite new, I guess, where you're using rose bushes the same as you would like cotton or linen, like a plant-based fiber. Uh, it's not the most eco-friendly, however, I read, because of the way that you need to process that. It does involve like a lot of chemicals. So fair enough. This is 350 meters per 100 gram. So it's fingering weight for ply. And yeah, it's a caramel color. They had it in like white and black, I think, but I thought that this was quite nice and neutral. Um, so I got two, but this one is bigger and thicker. So I think this is going to be enough for a fingering weight sweater or cardigan. I was thinking of making the Poet by Sari Nordland or the um, Fleurist by Sari Nordland. And I think I'm erring more towards Fleurist. That one is a bottom-up lace cardigan, drop shoulder. I think it's stunning according to the description. I have enough yardage to do that. I think it, it would be really hard because like it bottom up is, is harder because of trying to gauge fit. And then the lace everywhere and the button bands, like it looks really difficult personally. I, I think it's gonna be a hard one, but I think it would highlight the yarn really well and suit it, like something made of rose and then the name is Fleurist. I think it's great. So I'm really happy about that weird purchase. Then the next one is uh, three kinds of this which is another 100% British wool mix of Derbyshire, Gritstone and Shetland fleece and it's semi-worsted spun four ply 300 meters per 100 grams and it's like a light grey color like this and that one is very interesting because the vendor had a lot of swatches that she had made from different needle sizes and she really assured me that this one bloomed like insanely and you could almost get to like a sport way. You could pre-wash the yarn and then knit with it or you could just knit it with bigger needles and like have it bloom. I think I'm gonna... I don't think I'm gonna pre-wash it because it seems like a big hassle. And what I have planned for this is the Moonset Slipover by Ozetta. And if I had gotten two skeins, that would have been barely enough. But I wasn't sure if I was going to meet gauge or whether I would need to make a bigger one that would end up smaller on me, which would use more yarn. So I got three skeins of it. And then with the excess, the extra, I might make like a little scarf. It will not be a Sophie scarf. You will never find me saying I made a Sophie scarf. I would like to make one with like cables or lace. If I had like leftover of this, I would I would do that. It feels really nice and natural. Like it's very squishy. It's kind of like a little rough, but I wouldn't say itchy. Like it's just dry. I'm really bad at finding names for yarn. I'm so sorry. And then the last one is so pretty and luscious and it's, um, this one. So it's like a very nice, like natural white. Um, they're all natural colors, by the way, like all of these just natural. And I was surprised at myself for getting all of those light colors at the wool festival and no dark. There were some dark, like black sheep wools, but I think I find it easier to buy darks online because there's less surprise. 
but for colors like that I really just want to be able to see with my eyeballs and not a screen exactly the shade of these so I can pick the exact right off white or gray so this is simply Shetland for ply from Lammermuir wool and it's 100 grams 350 meters um, very nice and I think this is just going to be a simple raglan, like fingering weight white sweater. I'm so excited to have bought all these yarns. I left the event feeling absolutely exhausted mentally and socially. I was so buzzing like a kid, you know, after the first day of school. And I just felt like I had no regrets, you know, no regret of having bought too much and no regret of having bought too little. Like it was just perfect. And this time I know exactly how I need to prepare for my next one. Like I need to do a bit more research about yardages and, and having like patterns like on the list already, knowing if they fit. It was just a really, really great day. And like I said, I'm, I'm just so, so happy to have gone with friends. I think if you are alone and if you don't have anyone to go with you, it would also be like amazing and I would recommend it. And I think people would probably be quite happy to like have a chat with you and Something about the event that was amazing was recognizing everyone's like sweaters. There were so many like Mary Wallens in the wild or like Jennifer Steingas. There were some shawls that I recognized like Stephen West, etc. And it was like a game of like where's Waldo of just like, I know this, I know this. It was like Easter eggs everywhere. And I think, yeah, if you went alone and you saw someone's sweater that you recognized, you could strike up a conversation. And you know, when people are sitting down and having their lunch, and discussing yarn like maybe go and ask people for their advice like you can say you know oh i'm really thinking about this yarn at this stall have you guys checked it out what do you think i don't know i think it would be a good it would be a good opportunity to try and uh find something in common with people okay and then that leads me nicely into the last part of this episode which is a giveaway so the first part of the giveaway is to celebrate then having gone to that festival the lovely Eva, the organizer, found us at the end of the event and she gave this to, I don't know if all the podcasters or some, but she found some podcasters and she gave us this lovely yarn that I will now give away to some to someone. She said that it was, you know, to thank us podcasters for spreading the words about the event. I didn't receive anything else, like this is, she gave me this yarn to give to you, uh, to be transparent. Uh, this is called After Party, it's DK and was an, ex an exclusive for the Perth Festival of Yarn and it's 100% superwash merino, 225 meters per 100 grams. Um, it's called From the Midnight Diary, hand-dyed yarn. So it's a really nice mix of like very vibrant kind of blues and greens, there's some peach at the end. I really am bad at imagining what this is going to come up like as a swatch. Um, but yeah, this would be absolutely lovely, maybe as a scarf, maybe as a headband, maybe you could pair that with some mohair, um, maybe some DK weight socks, although I don't know if that would be enough. Maybe you can use it with stripes, like with white stripes or some navy stripes, that would be glorious actually, or like as an accent color in a sweater, like, you know, like the cuffs uh, and the ribbing. That could be really cool. So one of you lovely people is going to be able to get this. I'm so excited to be doing this. And unfortunately, I can only do it as a UK giveaway because of postage and admin work. So what I'll just ask for you to do is to subscribe to the channel and like the video and then comment below. You can comment anything, but I will just ask you that in your comment, can you put hashtag Perth? Because that way, when I'm drawing the winner on my random comment picker generator, I will filter it to only include comments that mention Perth. And so if you're putting Perth, hashtag Perth in your comment, I'm assuming that you have a UK address. And when we get in touch about like postage and everything, you're happy for me to send this to you like in the UK. And if for some reason you put hashtag Perth and you're not in the UK, I will have to draw again and get another winner because I really will just be able to send that in the UK. So if you want to get this lovely skein of wool, courtesy of Eva from the like wool showcase producer, then yeah, comment below 
hashtag Perth and obviously put something else in the comments if you want to but just just Perth is, is necessary uh, but then worry not if you're not in the UK because I'm also doing a giveaway to celebrate the 2500 subscribers milestone even though it's just numbers it's random but I like to celebrate and I had so much fun doing the previous one last time it was so great reading all the comments so if you're not in the US or if you don't want to win this yarn just comment anything and then you'll be entered into a another giveaway and then that will be to win another uh, pattern so I'll give you the pattern of your choice I can gift it to you on Ravelry or if you don't use Ravelry we can discuss something else so anyone can enter for that I did it last time and it worked perfectly it's the same re requirements just like the video subscribe and comment anything under this video so both winners will be picked in two weeks I'll do the same thing that I did last time where in the next episode that I release I will um, announce the winner in two weeks so that will be Monday 17th of April so don't reply to anyone or anything that gets in touch with you before that the only way that you know you have won this giveaway is if you watch the video I release on Monday the 17th of April and then you will get in touch with me either through YouTube or Instagram or email and that way we can avoid uh, any scams and that's just the way that works best if you see anyone, like any bots or anything pretending to be me, can you let me know in case I don't notice and then like I'll delete those comments. But yeah, I'm so excited. I hope that you will participate. I can't wait to see, you know, what you make with that yarn if, if you get it or what pattern you want to choose for the giveaway. I'll also be doing one little giveaway on my Instagram. So like I said before, my handle is at the woolly worker can go check the giveaway post there and participate in that. There's no restriction. If you're in the UK and you want to participate like in all of them, like go for it. All the best to you. And again, I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank everyone so much for watching my videos for so long, to watch them to the end, to participate in the giveaways, to comment, to give me feedback when I ask for it. You guys have been so good at like answering my questions when I have them and giving me recommendations. I'm so 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 grateful, I feel so lucky that I'm able to do this and I take so much pleasure in doing it and like I said it's just a joy to be sitting down and recording those podcasts, I always look forward to it. I'm looking forward for you to see my next video, it's already all filmed and edited, I had so many issues with editing it and this is why I didn't post a couple of weeks ago because like the software just wasn't working but the video is ready now so even though I filmed it early March, it's going to come out in April and this is going to be 10 t-shirts to knit this spring so if you want to so if you don't want to miss that then subscribe or come back later to see that video and i promise i am still working behind the scenes on the video where i will talk about 10 fingering weight sweaters to do there's clearly a lot to work with here but yeah i think i've said everything i need to say i hope that you found this video enjoyable and relaxing, that you got some good progress done on your knitting and that you have a lovely beginning of April if that's when you're watching. As always if you have any questions just let me know in the comments and if not I'll see you all next week. Good luck for the giveaway and yeah happy knitting! Bye everyone!